Good morning, Seed Church family. I am really, really excited by our turnout today. Um, today is a super exciting day. It's the first time we have done baptisms in our church since we were at the North High Pool. Um, so, funny story, I was one of the very first baptisms in our church when we were at the boathouse. And we used a giant tub that the boathouse uses to hand out alcoholic beverages when they have events there. So we, uh, we changed the purpose of that tub to uh, represent washing away of sins that day. It was kind of exciting and cool. Um, so I'm excited for us to be here today. Um, we have several baptisms. Um, today's just a great day that we celebrate the, uh, the resurrection of Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. Um, so I'm going to open up some prayer real quick, and I'm just let the worship team take it over. Um, it's also really exciting to have like a full band up here today. It's been, it's been a while since we've had that. So, God, I just, I thank you that your mercies are new daily. I thank you that you sacrificed your son on the cross for our sins. I thank you for just the hearts of the people that are in this room, the people that are listening online. You are good, and you're always good, Father, and you meet us where we're at. It's in your name I pray, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. This is a day of celebration, not just for the baptisms, but for our awesome Savior, Jesus Christ, who was able to raise from the grave. And that's something that we love to celebrate here at The Seed. And so we invite you to stand and hang out with us and sing to our awesome Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we're just, sorry, I'm just really excited about today. Baptisms, it's just a, it's fun stuff, so... sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in that's when death was arrested and my life began yeah Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom me faithfully bore yes he canceled my debt and he called me his friend that's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. 
It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. And our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. And darkness rejoices as though heaven had lost. It didn't. <laughs> but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yeah, we're free. Forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. Good morning. Definitely just want to echo what uh, Evan and, and Andrew are saying. It's just good to see everybody here. It's good to see all the pastel colors as well. I had to, <laughs> had to break up my purple shirt today. So, so I'm going to lead us in the corporate confession. Um, this weekend, I, or this week, I was watching a movie, and it had um, actor David, I think I'm saying his name right, Ayalowo in it. He's a great British actor, and he has a distinction of being just a really committed and outspoken a believer in, in Hollywood, and he's just kind of an interesting guy. So I was reading a little bit about him this week, and um, they asked him, you know, it was like a little interview, and they asked him a question. like, you know, obviously you're in Hollywood, you're always out places filming movies and all that. Do you really have a chance to actually go to church and, you know, congregate with other believers? And I just, his, his answer I just loved. He said, he's like, if I don't go to church, if I'm not with other believers, the wheels of my life are going to fall off. And so he's like, it doesn't matter where I'm at in the world, doing whatever, I find a church and I go. And I just, uh, <clears throat> I was just processing that a little bit this week that I don't know if there's, if there's any kind of sense of self-sufficiency in us, if there's any sense that we kind of got things under control. I mean, I think that's just the truth right there that he said that if I'm not constantly plugged into this, man, the, the wheels of my life are going to fall off. So as, we're, as we read this, as we do the, the next song, just be thinking about that. Just if there's any kind of sense of kind of that area of your life that you think you're, we're doing okay. I've kind of got it under control. Use this as a chance to confess that. But uh, let the message that Ryan's going to preach uh, really kind of just press into us that, like the Bible says, that we, they use the metaphor of, of a vine and branches, you know, and that we are plugged in the vine. That's the only life we have. And if we disconnect from that, it says we dry up, we wither, we fall to the ground, and eventually we're only good to be raked up, thrown in a pile and burnt. So as we do this corporate confession, just let us kind of mull on that. Father God, the power of the cross proclaims that we are loved. You invite us right now, just as we are. The proclaim of the resurrection proclaims that we can change. You invite us right now to become more like you. We confess that we don't trust your word enough. Bring your power into our lives today and root us in the good news of Jesus. How 
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written oh jesus christ my living hope yeah. who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living oh, And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Alleluia. Praise the one who set me free. Alleluia. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Cause Jesus, yours is the victory. Just want to read our verse and invite Ryan up and pray for him. Luke 24, 39 through 40. Look at my hands and my feet. That is, I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we just pray for, uh, pray for our message this, uh, this morning. We just pray that each of us would have tender hearts to receive it. That if there's uh, anything that I think... Uh, I know as frequently I find as I read the Word, I've just got a lot of things going through my mind, distracted, anxious about this or that. Father, I just pray that you would just grant us the, the ability to just listen, to receive your Word, to not resist it, Father, but to invite it in. Amen. Just uh, anoint Ryan as he, uh, as he preaches. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends, guest members, man, it's good to see you on this beautiful 
Easter morning here at the Seed Church. I am so thrilled you've joined us, either in person or online. Today, as you know, we're celebrating the resurrection. We're going to do that in the Word, but we're also going to do that in the lives of three people through baptism here in a few minutes. So we're going to start with our time in the Word, and we're going to move toward the baptism. So let's jump right in together because we have a lot of great stuff this morning. And here's the three points we're going to see in the Word today. Number one, the embarrassing credibility of the resurrection. Number two, the life-changing consolation of it. And number three, the personal friendship of the resurrection. And and maybe uh, from the outside you're saying this is obviously a big religious holiday for Christians and this whole thing of resurrection. But boy, if this even is true, this happened over 2,000 years ago, how, how does... How does this touch my life in any practical way today? So number one, the embarrassing credibility of the resurrection. When someone tells you something far-fetched, what are the questions that pop up in your mind? Maybe things like, are you sure? Are your sources credible? Did you read this on the internet? (laughs) Uh, Have you been getting enough sleep lately? Did you by chance eat some expired seafood? Because you sound crazy. You sound crazy. Now listen, Jesus' disciples were a lot like us, and they did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus when they first heard. You know, they they were born over 2,000 years ago, but that doesn't mean they were born yesterday. And just because ancient people had less technology than us, there is no empirical evidence that they had a lower IQ. So when they heard Jesus has risen, they didn't believe. But even more than that, not only did they not believe, But these men who had so confidently said to Jesus, Jesus, we're going to stick it out. Jesus, we're going to stay faithful. We'll never lose course. We're going to see in Scripture, they've locked themselves in a small room in fear. And so here's what's so interesting about this. When these disciples wrote the Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first four books of the New Testament. When they wrote the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, They openly shared about how unfaithful and afraid they were. And it points to an embarrassing credibility to the story. Let me show you how. We're going to look at five things about the embarrassing credibility of the resurrection. Number one, as I already mentioned, the disciples were hiding. Look at John chapter 20, verse 19 with me on the screen. When it was evening of that first day of the week... The disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Number two, their hiding was particularly embarrassing because the female disciples were not hiding. All four of the gospels say the women were moving about the tomb. Now, here's why this matters immensely. This happened in the ancient Near East. And even up till today, the ancient Near East has what's called an honor-shame culture. That's different from our culture, which is an individualistic culture. In an honor-shame culture, manhood is all about honor. In honor-shame culture, listen, if you want to start a business, you won't do any business if you're not an honorable man in the community. When you go to war, you don't cry, you don't whine, you don't show your emotions. When adversity comes, you stay strong. Now, some of you know this. Because some of you grew up with parents who maybe grew up in an honor-shame culture, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because there's certain grades you got to get and ways you carry yourself, things you do, things you don't say. You're upholding family honor. That's your job. That's the world these disciples lived in. And when they wrote the eyewitness accounts, they openly shared and distributed copies that said, yeah, while the women weren't hiding, we were. That's fascinating. Number three, now it gets even more humorously pathetic because when the women went to the tomb and they saw it was empty, they went to go tell the men, right? So they had to go find them and and knock on their locked door. And this is in the Bible, Luke 24, verses 10 through 11. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. So here's the picture. Here's the entourage of women who are all approaching the locked door. You know, here comes Peter, like in a hotel, opens it with the chain on. He's peeking out, and the tomb is empty. Something's happened. And Peter says, ladies, we're too brave hiding. We can't listen to this nonsense, all right? I don't 
I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds crazy. Leave us alone. They wrote this about themselves. Wow. Number four, it gets even worse. So because they would not listen to the women, the resurrected Jesus himself appears in their nice little locked room and rebukes them for unbelief and hardness of heart. Mark 16, 14. Later he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. So it wasn't enough. They wouldn't listen to their, the female disciples. So Jesus has to show up and set them straight. And number five, even after this rebuke, which came directly from Jesus, some of the disciples still doubted. Matthew 28, 16 through 17. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Now, why did I go through that? What is the point of looking at these guys writing things so embarrassing about themselves? Well, here's why. One of the most common objections to the resurrection goes like this. Have you ever seen someone rise from the dead? I haven't. Pretty unlikely. I'll tell you what really happened. They made it up. And the motive makes sense, right? Because who are the disciples? Fishermen, blue-collar people, tax collectors, they're nobodies. Then Jesus shows up, and they're somebodies. And they're, they're in an entourage with Jesus, and, and they're being seen. And boy, they're getting prestige and reputation and, and money and power and influence. And then Jesus dies, and the disciples say, I don't want this show to be over. I don't want... I don't want to be a nobody anymore. So here's what we'll do, guys. Here's a great plan. Ready? Ready? We'll make it up. This is a, this is a very common objection to the resurrection. Just, hey, isn't it more common that someone just made this up? Let me ask you a super reasonable question. If you're in an honor-shame culture and you're making this up to get influence and power, do you make yourself look this dumb? Do you go so far out of your way to completely obliterate your honor with every other man in the culture? Yeah, so listen, guys, got a great idea. Let's make this up. People will follow us, all right? All right, everyone read what we wrote. I promise once you read this, you'll know you should follow us. You'll just know once you see that when adversity came that we hid and the women didn't. And they had to come find us and we thought they were crazy. So Jesus shows up and rebukes us because of how much we weren't listening, and then some of us still doubted. Why in the world, if someone was making this up, would you ever write that? That's fascinating, isn't it? And even more from history, we know that all these disciples faced torture and death. So would you make up a lie, actively distribute copies to everyone, saying, please notice how much of a coward I am, and then turn around and die for this hoax you created. Here's what I think is pretty fascinating. You don't find anything like this in other world religions. Nothing like this. Go to other world religions, and all the leaders go way out of their way to point out that there's nothing wrong, and, and they've done everything right, and they found the way. Not Christianity. And maybe some of you say, whoa, Ryan, hold up. I've been in some churches. I've seen some things in the news. I've heard of and seen plenty of Christians who are just kind of putting up a front and hiding. And all I have to say is, just because someone says they're following Jesus does not mean they're following Jesus. Amen. That's not Christianity. In Christianity, these guys are openly sharing how broken and messed up and unfaithful and cowardly they were in the deepest moment of adversity for the whole world to read. Why would they do that? How is it possible that Christianity thrived and became the most vibrant religion in the Roman Empire with these guys in the lead? How is that possible? Historians have looked at the early church. Here's what they've noticed. No religion like it. Because when you read the Old Testament, people chose gods based on ethnicity or city, right? So you have your Roman gods and your Greek gods and your African gods and you know, a certain farmer, for example, is going to worship the god of rain, and the general is going to worship the god of war, 
right? And the artist is going to worship the God of beauty. And everyone picks their own God based on city, ethnicity, or, or what they do, their vocation. Then Christianity comes along, and nobody can explain it. Because when it thrives, it's people getting together who are rich and poor. Every ethnicity, stratified socioeconomic status, men and women, young and old, all these different cities, different places, somehow all coming together because someone named Jesus changed their life. And it just blew up in the early church. Boy, how did these guys lead a movement like that when they're actively circulating stories of how untrustworthy they were unless this really did happen? And the reason why they were honest about this is because it's just what happened. And the church blew up because Jesus didn't stay six feet under. So it's just not a reasonable objection to say, these guys must have made this up. This never takes off if these guys make this up. No one's going to follow these guys. You all know this is true, right? Think about our culture. When just a politician says, I'm going to do this and doesn't do this, the whole world is like, get your tomatoes. Time to blast this guy. He's a liar. Here's these guys coming out saying, we walked with Jesus. We learned from him. Oh, by the way, we didn't do anything he told us to do. Uh, you know, we didn't follow through on any of it, actually. Welcome to the church. Welcome to the church. Jesus is our sufficiency. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus changes us. And we don't have to hide. Number two, the life-changing consolation. Believing the resurrection will change your life. And I want to show you how. The main reason is this. In the face of suffering, it will give you a kind of consolation you can find nowhere else. And so we're going to start by reading here for this section, Luke 24, verses 39 to 43. Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet, but while they were still amazed, and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, first off, what is that? Have you ever read the big myths and legends about other religions and gods? Here's how they don't go. Jesus came. He was the Son of God. He did miracles and changed the world. He died for sins. He rose from the dead. He went to his disciples and said, Let's eat fish. You have any fish? What in the world? Right? This, doesn't, this does not read like some religious myth of power. It reads like a dude chumming at Long John Silver's with his buddies. Right? <laughs> hey, bro, you got any fish? I'll take some. What's the point of this? Why is this in the Bible? It's not that inspiring. It's just weird. Here's why it's in the Bible. Because when Jesus comes, he says, it's me. Touch me, see me, it's me, it's really me. It's not spirit me, it's not fog me, it's not Star Wars hologram me, it's me, touch me. In fact, that fish right there, let me polish that off right now for you, it's me. Why does this matter? You know, for most people, the most painful thing they will experience in this life is losing someone they love when they die. Because when someone dies, they are not in the other room. They are not living somewhere else in the world. You cannot call them. You cannot hear their voice. They are gone. I went to two family funerals this last month with my wife. One for a young lady in her early 20s who was preparing to be a missionary in Japan. And on her way home, a large vehicle came across the center line, hit her head on and killed her. And I went to a second funeral for a man in his 50s who had been a faithful teacher, basketball coach, and athletic director in a small hometown school for 30 years. And he left behind a wife and four kids, and his two youngest boys were twins who played basketball and just led their schools to a state championship, and a week later, he died. But he got to see his sons, after coaching basketball for three decades, lead the school to a state championship. And it's so common when someone dies. Do you know what they say? 
I still can't believe that they're just not in the other room. I still can't, it just still doesn't land on me that I can't pick up a phone and hear their voice, that they're gone. Now, our culture lives in self denial when it comes to death. We really do. And so we try to give consolations to people. What's a consolation, by the way, if I'm using this word and you don't know what it means? To console someone means if someone is grieving, you do something to help them through their grief, right? You say something, you give them a hug, you bring flowers, you're trying to console them. And in our culture, there are some consolations we use that we mean to help people, but if you think about them, they are so thin. Here's a couple of them. They will live on in our memories and they are gone but never forgotten. Now let's just like look at these honestly, right? They live on in my memories? No, they don't. They don't live on. And the memories don't always help me because it brings waves of grief because I don't want a picture or a memory. I want them. And no, they don't live on because nothing new is happening. It's all frozen in amber. And as I get older, I begin to forget exactly how their voice or their laugh sounded. They don't live on in my memories. They're gone. What about gone but never forgotten? When everyone who knew them and loved them dies, who's going to remember them? What about in 500 years? Everyone is forgotten. Now, I'm not saying these to say that our attempts to give consolations are dumb. No, 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 no. We say these things to love on people, but beneath the surface, we see our culture doesn't have much to say. You're not really saying anything. And this is why the resurrection was such a big part of why Christianity exploded and still explodes in new cultures today all the time. Because what if I told you that you didn't have to say goodbye, but you could say, I'm going to see you soon. What if that was real? What if you didn't have to say goodbye? You could literally say, so long, I'll see you again. What if it was true for everyone you loved that if they trusted Jesus... You would live with them forever in the presence of God. What if that was true? If we felt that all the way down in our bones, would we on occasion maybe talk more about the hope we have in this guy named Jesus with people we love? I don't mean starting up arguments. I don't mean some anger about I'm right and you're wrong. I don't mean turning someone into a a pet evangelistic project that I need to save them so I feel better. I mean out of real love and compassion for other people that have all been made in God's image, that when we're with them, we would say, God, give me an opportunity to talk about why I hope in Jesus today. I mean, if we felt that in our bones, I wouldn't ever have to say goodbye. I mean, how would that change us? Notice what the verses say. They say the risen Jesus came to his disciples as a man, not some disembodied spirit. And the Bible says they were so overwhelmed, they were amazed in joy. So when Jesus came, you know how it went? He shows up. He says, it's me. And the disciples are saying, Jesus, I I have not understood what you've been saying this whole time. Are you really saying to me? Are you saying that if I trust you, this doesn't have to end? Like you're... You're saying this time we've had with you and my friends, these disciples, that if we trust you, this is not going to end. We get to do this some more. This isn't just going to go away. And Jesus says, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And friends, this is why the resurrection will change your life. Because the resurrection isn't really a consolation. It's not just something nice to say. You know what resurrection is? It's restoration. Here's how the Old Testament puts it. The years that the locusts have eaten will be restored to you. Slow down and think with me. Can any of you think of years in your life that you feel pain because you say, I wish I could go back and do something different? Maybe some of you were grieving because you lost someone very close to you. 
And there's just a season of your life that just feels gone because you weren't right in the head and right in the heart and it just feels like they're gone. Or there's things that you did where you made decisions and you say, if I could just go back and make different decisions, I wouldn't be here. And the resurrection says, don't do something dumb to try to relive a short time because you're going to get back everything and more. Everything is restored. Revelation, the last book of the Bible says, all sorrow is swallowed up in joy. Every tear is wiped away. And honestly, if we're really hearing the resurrection right, the, the, the most honest skeptical response would be, this is just too good to be true. This is just too good to be true. But this is what Jesus teaches. This is what Christianity teaches. And so it will change your life and help us do what Paul says, where he says, forgetting what lies behind, I move on, I press on to what's ahead. Why? Because I don't have to compensate for my past. I don't have to sit in guilt and shame and wonder if I can redo something. I don't have to live in this space of pain and sorrow because resurrection is restoration. That's why it'll change our lives. And that's why Christianity exploded in the early church. And now number three, the personal friendship of the resurrection. We all want the people we love to always be in our lives, but there is nothing like friendship with God. Nothing even comes close. So read with me in John chapter 20, verses 11 to 16. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now, when I went to Israel a few years ago, I spent a little bit of time in Magdala. This is why Mary is called Mary Magdalene, because she's a woman from Magdala. And maybe you're wondering, why is that her name? Where's her family name? Where's her uh, last name? Why is she just Mary from where she's from? Well, Magdala, in the time of Jesus, was a small, blue-collar fishing town. And the Bible says that when Jesus met Mary, she was deeply troubled and broken. The Bible says she was spiritually under demonic attack. It says she was psychologically and emotionally broken. And just think about this with me. How does this go? Young woman who grows up in a broken family, where she's isolated and avoided, deeply troubled, alone. This is Mary Magdalene, until Jesus meets her. And the Bible says that when Mary was saved, the whole rest of Jesus' ministry, she went with other female disciples to care for Jesus' phys physical needs. She prepared meals for Jesus and took care of shelter and clothing as the disciples were traveling, is what Mary did. And so what's Mary doing now? Well, she's crying because this is the only friend, at one point in her life, this was the only friend she had in the whole world, was Jesus. And so she's at the tomb, lonely, crying. And all the gospels say, all the gospels say that Mary Magdalene was the first person to see the risen Jesus. And this blows me away. This is Jesus Son of God, King of kings, Prince of peace, the creator of all things, Jesus, God in the flesh. He raises from the dead. And what does he do? Go up in the heavens and say, you know, I'm back? Or does he go to the Pharisees and say, told you so, fools? Or does he go do some big religious work? No, what does Jesus do? He goes to local goodwill, dresses up like a gardener, gets a hand shovel, shows up, and hey, who are you looking for? What, uh, what you crying about? And what's this showing us? Jesus comes back from the dead 
And his first task is this. I want to go see my friends. I want to go see my friends. And he goes and he sees Mary and she doesn't recognize him until when? At what point does she know it's him? Mary. Because he knew her so well, he could say her name in just that way that she was like, he knows me. It's him. Jesus doesn't come back from the dead to get to work on hard religious stuff. He comes back from the dead to go see his friends. Because the resurrection is about friendship with God. It's about daily, persevering, prayer life in the word, serving others, friendship with the God of all creation. That's what the resurrection is about. And so we're going to do something really simple together before we move to the baptisms. And we'll do that in just a moment here. But uh, as we close here, I want all of you to close your eyes with me. Everyone close your eyes. You can keep your head up, put your head down. Just close your eyes along with me. And uh, I want you to think about these things with your eyes closed. I want you to think about a time in your life when you felt really, really alone. Maybe it's a season of hard trial or suffering. Maybe you're thinking of a hard time in your childhood when things weren't right in your family and you felt alone. Maybe you're thinking of someone who passed away, aching if you could hear their voice again. Maybe you're just feeling the pain of recognizing that more of your life may very well be behind you than it is in front of you. And maybe you feel pain right now. So keep your eyes closed and listen to these questions. What if God really loves you beyond your wildest imagination? What if he has always seen you and is even seeing you right now and he is full of love for you? What if he knew you on a first name basis and he could say your name in just such a way, just a way that you knew beyond doubt it was him, the God who made you and loves you, the friend who will never leave you, Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now open your eyes with me. Do you know Jesus like that? I'm not saying, is God your master? Is God your boss? Is God your helper? Is God your rule giver? Is God your king? Is God your, is God your friend? Is God your friend? Do you long for God to be your friend? Listen, friends. If you don't know Jesus like that, before you leave this room or turn off this video, you need to change that. You need to change that. And you need to come to Jesus, not in some distant working relationship where he just like tells you what to do or gives you rules or gives you blessings or whatever it may be, but a God who comes in your life, who walks with you, who can say your name, and you say, that's my friend. That's my friend Jesus who rose from the dead to take me home. Friends, if you don't believe that, you need to. And maybe you're thinking, Ryan, how do I do that? I don't even know what that looks like. Well, that's why we have some baptisms. So as these men are going to get up here soon and share how Jesus transformed them and just share whatever they share from their life, I just want you to be asking God, Lord, what are, you, what are you saying to me in the work you've done in them? Okay, so we're going to pray now together and then we're going to move that direction toward the baptisms. Dear Jesus, um, this is Easter Sunday and Lord, it's an easy Sunday at some level to just stay on the cultural surface and to kind of do what we're expected to do. In fact, God, this could even be a Sunday where it maybe feels weird to go deep with you because the room is full. And man, I was just kind of looking forward to dressing up and eating a really big ham. Uh, but Lord, maybe you're showing up in the lives of some people right now and you are pointing to places of pain and hurt 
that they have tried to fix with things that aren't working. And God, maybe some of us here are trying to fix it with things that we know are shameful. Maybe we're doing things in the dark or we're turning to substances or things like that that we know there's no life in, but we don't know how to get out of it. God, give them courage to confess that today, to come forward after service. But God, maybe some of us have really great lives. It's what it feels like. But we're trying to basically fix it by trying to be beautiful enough or handsome enough or chiseled enough. We're trying to fix it by being smart enough, well-read enough, intellectual enough, having the right pedigree and the right degrees. We're trying to fix it with a career. If we could make enough, if we could climb high enough, if we could have enough distinction. God, maybe we're fixing it with our family. If our kids were healthy enough, if they were accomplished enough, if they were good enough at that sport or those academics. And Lord, what you're showing us this morning is If we go to those places, they will fail us because they can't be our friend. Because God, if we're finding life and career, when career goes south, it just punishes us. And if we're looking for life and beauty, when we get older, it just punishes us. Jesus, you're the only one who through thick and thin, you stay our friend. And God, we need your friendship in our life. And I pray this morning, if there's anyone here, Lord, who needs to meet you in a radical saving way and throw out kind of half-hearted cultural Christianity, but really come to you as savior and friend, God, would you do that work in their heart? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we've got three baptisms and I am so pumped uh, for them and they're going to they're gonna lead us. And I'll tell you this, as they're doing this, would you just, if you're a believer in the room, would you pray for them and, and thank the Lord for them? And maybe after service, before we leave, just come up real briefly and say, so glad. Because it's hard to do this, right? It's hard to get up on stage and talk to a bunch of people. You know, it's not easy to do. And uh, I'm so pumped that they're going to be leading us and being a part of that. So we've got our first baptism, which is Joe. Come on up, Joe. So Joe is going to share with you, and then Matt Hatzel is going to read uh, some scripture over Joe, and then we'll go to the back and get him wet. Hi, how are y'all doing? Um, It's been a rough 19 years for me. Uh, The shirt is true. Um, I am a hot mess, and uh, I'm ready to change that in my life. You know, ever since I walked into the sea, I was saved in 2016, and you know, the Lord's been leading me to just changed my life and softened my heart. And, you know, it's been a big, big turnaround for me, you know. Um, ever since I got the Holy Spirit in my heart, you know, I've started to make better decisions in my life. And, you know, I've got the right people around me, support, and all the, um, my beautiful daughter and my family. And, you know, without God, you know, uh, none of this would be possible. And, you know, I'm just really excited to take this new step in my life and uh, walk with the Lord. And that's all I've got. Take the mic from me. <laughs> hey, so I asked Ryan if I could uh, get up here and Go talk. Go get set up and wait. On behalf of Joe and Tyrese. So I just wanted to say a few things directly to these guys, but this applies to all of us, really. Um, so I haven't known Joe very long, what, a couple months now, maybe? Um, but man, the transformation in his life in that short time has been nothing short of remarkable. Only the work of God. Uh, I, can, I can recall a, a Bible study, Ryan was there, where Joe was talking about, he was just questioning, like, what, what's happening when I'm in Scripture and when I'm thinking of God and I'm just, like, trembling? <laughs> and I was like, man, you're experiencing God. Like, this is beautiful. And so it's, it's been a great joy to get to know you, Joe. Uh, just a quick thing. My challenge to you this morning is that you endure, brother. You endure. Um, I've been reading through this devotional with my son. And a couple nights ago, we read through one where it talked about stalactites and stalagmites in caves and how the process goes where this water like drips through these caves and Mm. these cracks. And over time, the calcite buildup starts to form these 
you know, these stalactites, I believe, from the top and stalagmites from the bottom. And, and sometimes it, it goes for so long that they actually grow together, right? And so there's going to be seasons of your life where it feels like you're growing very slow, just like one drip at a time. But that's how God works over the course of your life, man, your whole life. He's going to continue sanctifying you every single day. And so I just want to pray a scripture over you, and then you can get baptized. Give me just a sec. All right, so this is in Philippians 1, starting in verse 3. It says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And Joe, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Joe, based on your profession that Jesus is Lord, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to the family, Joe. Love you, brother. Tyrese. Next, we've got Tyrese. Come on up, brother. Yeah. All right, my name is Tyrese. I'm um, actually prepared a, pe- a speech for this. Um, I'm a little nervous. Um, so, oh, <clears throat> my name is Tyrese, and I'm an ex meth addict and also lived in my life as a homosexual. I've been fighting with the Lord on simply giving my life to him. The year 2020 was a rough year for me, as it might have been for most of us. The year 2020 made me realize that I didn't have anything meaningful besides God. The meth addiction is what brought me to him. Before the fact, I was a person who did not like hearing about Jesus. You know that saying, with the enemy meant for evil, um, God turns it around for good? Well, that's exactly what God did in my case. Day by day, God is restoring me back to him and what he created me for. I'm very grateful to be alive and to tell everyone what Jesus has done in my life. I'm a still work in progress, but it is by God's grace and mercy that I'm still here today. Amen. Same thing for Tyrese. Haven't known him very long, but again, man. So you're going to get down on your knees. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say something about Tyrese. This guy has been iron sharpening iron in my life in a way that I don't know anyone else has. Hmm. His willingness to be vulnerable, to walk in the light, Hmm. is just astounding to me. And it has grown me just in the short time that I've known him. So, Tyrese, I just want to pray a scripture over you. That's one of my favorite scriptures. It's in 2 Timothy 4. And it was Paul in his, his last letter to Timothy, what he's telling him. And it's what I want to tell you today, brother. So uh, chapter four, starting in verse one, says, I charge you, Tyrese, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Mm. reprove, rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from the listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Tyrese, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. Fight the good fight, Tyrese. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You know what's laid up for you in heaven, brother? The crown of righteousness, which Hmm. the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day. And not only to you, but to all who have loved his appearing. Tyrese, based on your profession that Jesus is Lord, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to the family, brother. And he's already up. The next is John. Brian, this is not fair. Um, 
So Ryan asked for me to share my story. Two things came to mind. One, that's terrifying, especially with how many people are up here. Two, uh, I'm glad we're not doing it in the fish pond outside. So <laughs> that was my second thought. Um, <laughs> my story is uh, the difference between knowledge and understanding. Um, growing up, Jesus was always in our house. I can't look at my mom, so. Uh, Jesus was always in our house, and uh, I never really understood. You know, he's a good moral person. You know, it's a good way to do it. I think uh, my upbringing, I think I might have used the resurrection as a, well, Jesus still loves me, Mom. It's fine. So, but until I got out of college and Cassie and I were looking to have kids and we got told by a doctor, you cannot have kids. Okay, that's not the plan, but okay. Um, two months later, we found out we were pregnant. So, okay, perfect. You know, maybe we don't know everything in this world. And then as soon as I held my daughter for the first time, and looked into her eyes and felt this unconditional love for her. I finally got it. I got it. I got what God's love for us is. And from that day, we came to the seed almost six years ago, and it's been the way. It's been perfect. So, all right, Jesus, my Savior, let's get this done. <laughs> I'm going to read a verse that he wanted me to read. I love you. I'm Cassie, by the way. I love you so much. Hi. Hi. Okay. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Amen. John, based on your profession that Jesus is Lord, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to the family, brother. Love you, man. All right, friends, with that, we are going to do communion together now. And after communion, we have some more singing to do. And so, uh, listen, in the spirit of what I said earlier, there is still time as we do communion and as we sing for you to ask the Lord what he's saying to you, if anything, this morning, and to do something with that. Uh, to lean into someone, to ask for help or direction, or to set up maybe time for coffee this week. If you're a believer this morning, you can find one of these either under your chair, or if you're in a black chair, if a black chair is in front of you, it'll be like in the wire rack thing. So go ahead and grab your communion cup, and we're going to do that together in just a moment. If you haven't done this before, you can open up a thin flap on the top, to reach a wafer. Brothers and sisters, what we just witnessed is something Jesus tells us to do that represents dying with Christ and being risen to new life in baptism. And the only reason why that's possible is because Jesus was broken to make you and me whole. And as we eat this, we're remembering his sacrifice for us. Eat with me of the body. Open your juice, which represents the blood of Jesus. And maybe this morning, something you've not heard in a long time, or maybe never, is when you trust Jesus, the Bible says there is no condemnation for your sin. You know what that means? It means God will never put your failure in your face. He'll discipline you because he loves you. He'll change you because you're one of his sons or daughters. He will never punish you again because Jesus takes that punishment for you. Amen. Drink of the new covenant with me. All right, friends, let's worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Sorry, I might be clearing my throat because I was crying that whole time. So thanks, everyone. How beautiful. How awesome, though. So
So we're going to continue singing to our awesome Father. We're going to continue the song we were singing earlier, Living Hope. And we're going to finish the song. So if you'd like to stand with us, you can. Again, we're just going to worship our Father this morning. Keep continuing to worship Him, pray to Him. Whatever it is you want to do this morning for Him, that's why we're here today. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me no cause Jesus yours is the victory Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God. You are our living hope. Church family, we're going to now pray to our Heavenly Father assurance. We are able to go to Him knowing that He can forgive us. He conquered the cross for us. That alone is crazy. But then he conquered death. No one can do that. Only he can do that. And he did that for us, and we're able to get to see him later because of that. So if you believe that this morning, let's pray this together. In the person of Jesus Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Lord, for the sake of your great name, for the sake of your eternal glory, Forgive our sins, for they are too numerous to count. Thank you for being so rich in wonderful mercy. Amen.
stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his His blood blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him one final breath he gave as heaven looked away the sun of God was laid in darkness, a battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken, the ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away.
Well, church family, what a great morning to get to sing. He is alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Thanks. That's great. A lot of people might not know that, so. He is risen indeed. Hey, he is risen. Right on. At least that's what we believe here. So amen to that this morning. Church family, if you do not believe what we believe and you have questions, please ask someone, your friends, your family. Ryan's cool. We're bald, so we're pretty cool. Um, But anyway, uh, church family, everyone guess. It's really good to see a lot of people here. Um, I hope to see you again someday, even when I'm not here. So I hope you know Christ the way that we do. And I just love you all. I hope you all have a great day. God bless.